Uh, kia ora koutou. my name is Helen Aki. I'm the manager of Behavioural Science Aotearoa at the Ministry of Justice in New Zealand. And I'm Olivia Wills, I'm an advisor in the team. Um, so before, um, so today's presentation is about how we use behavioural insights to increase fines collection in New Zealand. But before we go into behavioural science, I just wanted to give you a little bit of background about New Zealand. Um, so we are a really small country of about 5 million people um, and with a, um, an area size around the si same size as Colorado or the UK. And about a quarter of our population was not born in New Zealand, including Olivia and myself. Um, and about 15% of our population are Māori, which is the indigenous population of New Zealand. The other really important thing that you need to know about New Zealand is, is that, in my opinion, it is the most beautiful country in the whole world. Um, so we work at the Ministry of Justice. And uh, the main aim of the ministry is working together for a fair and safe Aotearoa. Um, and Aotearoa is the Māori name for New Zealand. Um, it means land of the long white cloud. Um, and if any of you have ever travelled to New Zealand, you will completely understand where that name came from. So um, towards that aim, one of the main things that we do is we partner with the judiciary to support the running of the courts and the tribunal's service. But we also do a heap of other things aside from that. And one of those things is fines collection. So if you go through the court and you're found, found guilty of a crime, um, the judge can decide to get a few different options um, of sentences they can give you. So you can be sentenced to prison, you can be sentenced to community work, or you can be given a fine. And fine is a really important sanction in the New Zealand justice process uh, because there's research out there that shows that fines actually help to prevent reoffending in the future. And as well as collecting money from um, court fines, we also um, work on behalf of the New Zealand police and local uh, government to collect fines and infringements uh, that they issue. So things like if you had a speeding ticket um, or a parking fine that you need to pay. And we also uh, collect reparations on behalf of victims of crime. So the total debt that's owed in New Zealand is about 380 million US dollars. That's the equivalent of 78 US dollars for every single man, woman and child in New Zealand. And about one in 10 people within New Zealand um, owe money and fines to the Ministry of Justice. So one in 10, pretty significant proportion of our population that we're trying to reach. And we use a range of different methods to collect that money. So things like um, letters and, uh, that we would send out for reminders for people. Um, we would telephone people to encourage them to pay their fines. So um, we make around 1.3 million um, phone calls every single year to encourage people to pay. And, and remembering our population is about 5 million, so 1.3 million phone calls is a pretty significant amount. Um, through to some um, other uh, sanctions, things like um, taking money directly from people's wages or their benefit payments, um, bailiffs seizing property, um, right through to warrants to arrest. And when we do those enforcement actions, um, there's a cost associated that gets added onto that debt. So if people don't pay their fines early on, um, that's quite a significant um, extra amount of money that they need to pay, and also a lot of extra stress that they need to go through. And most of the time, people have actually just forgotten to pay their fines. So um, one of the things that we do is to try and help encourage people to pay those, those fines early. And one of the ways that we've um, uh, tried to do that is by use of behavioural insights. So I'm going to pass over to Olivia, who's going to tell you a little bit more about what is behavioural science and how we used it in this context. So before we start talking about what behavioural insights is, we're going to start with a game. So for this, you're going to need um, a pen and paper or your phone. Um, and if you're watching this online, then I encourage you to join in too. So I'm going to read out a list of words, um, and then I'm going to ask you to write down as many of them as you can remember. So here we go with the words. Bed. Awake. Tired. Dream. Wake. Snooze. Blanket, doze, snore, nap, peace, yawn, drowsy. Okay, so you've now got one minute to write down all the words you can remember.
time's up. Okay, now I'm going to go through some of those words. Um, and if you can remember them, if you've got them down on your list, then just put your hand up. So, did you get snore? Quite a lot of snore. Wake? Yeah. Blanket? Nap? Sleep? Yes, a lot for sleep. Actually, sleep was not on the list. <laughs> <laughs> so, our brain was trying to be helpful there um, because we're used to associating all of these words with sleep. Um, so that's why it just associated into that. So we actually created a false memory. Um, and that's an example of a, a mental shortcut that we've taken there. And I hope that game hasn't put you all to sleep. <laughs> so this is an example of a behavioral insight. So these are the ways that our brain works to try and make sense of a really complicated environment. So we might think that we're behaving rationally, um, but actually we're relying on all sorts of shortcuts and biases to help us just manage a really complicated world that we're living in. Um, so for example, when you go to the supermarket, um, there's all sorts of biases at play, even though you might think you're just choosing things that you want. So for example, you might pick the brand of soap that you chose last time, um, just because you know that you had it last time, um, or you might um, be affected depending on whether you're hungry or full, might change the food that you choose, or even if you're going shopping with someone, um, that might also affect the things that you choose. Um, so we're being affected by these things all the time. But actually, um, programs and policies and legislation are often designed as if we do respond rationally to incentives and to information. So what we can do with behavioral science is we can use our understanding of how the brain works um, to design policies that actually incorporate these mental shortcuts so that we're designing things that can work with them instead of against them. So the behavioral insights team in the UK developed this EAST framework, um, and this is to try to make things which uh, incorporate behavioral science so we can design things that influence behavior the best. So, it starts with easy, uh, and that's just about making things easy. And um, there's a lot of evidence that simplification um, can be really impactful in making things easy to do, so people know what they need to do um, and the information is right there for them. You can make it attractive. So that's all about just highlighting key things, making it personal, um, using names and color and images. And um, Social. So we know that social norms are really, really powerful. Um, we like to do what other people are doing. Um, and knowing what other people approve of can be really impactful on our own behaviors. And timely. So this is about um, giving people the information at the right time when they're in a position to act on it. So if someone asks you to do something just before you're about to fall asleep, that's not a good time. Um, so right when you're ready to hear it and to make an action is when you want that information. So we use this EAST framework to develop a trial um, to look at increasing fines payments in New Zealand. So I'm going to talk through um, a reminder letter which we sent to people with overdue fines. Um, and we tried out four different letters which we randomised to our sample. So this is the control letter, and this is the letter which was already going out uh, to New Zealanders. Um, this is already quite easy to understand. Um, so it passes the flip test, which means we can understand the gist of it with a two-second glance. We can see it's got an outstanding fine, tells you the amount and it tells you the consequences. Um, but we can improve on that with some behavioral science. So this is a simplified version of the letter. Um, and you can see that we're really drawing from the EAST framework here. So we want to make it easy. So we've got this clear call to action, um, pay your outstanding, outstanding fine now to prevent further actions. And um, we've also making it really easy to pay. So we're drawing attention to the, the ways to pay um, so people know exactly what it is they need to do. We're also making it attractive um, with the use of colour. So we've got uh, using this red to make the important information stand out. Um, and we know from eye tracking research that people spend the most time looking at the top third of a letter. So that's where we put the most important information. We also make it timely. So we say, please pay within 10 days. And that's so people know exactly what kind of time frame they're working with to try to make them um, change the behavior as quickly as possible. 
And then we've got this fresh start letter. So this one is just the same as that simplified letter, but with an added sentence, which says, so far we have treated this as a simple mistake, but if you fail to pay now, we will treat it as an active choice. So this kind of fresh start idea, um, we might be familiar with if we think about kind of landmark times when we make decisions. So for example, at New Year, you might decide that January I'm going to join the gym or say uh, on a landmark birthday, that might be a time for you to run your first half marathon. Um, and we're using that same kind of idea by saying this is an opportunity for a fresh start and to change again. And when we did this trial, there wasn't very much um, evidence using this. There, there was one effective trial um, in Guatemala which shows that this can be effective. And then we have our social norm message. So this, again, is the same as the simplified letter, but with the extra sentence, the vast majority of people pay their fines. You are in the small minority that still has to pay. So this is using that idea of um, social norms from the EAST framework. Um, and there's a lot of research to show that this can be really powerful. So there's evidence that um, it can reduce household energy consumption if you know the amount of energy that the houses around you are using. Um, and it can also be effective for um, tax compliance. So we designed our trial with, um, we had 29,000 participants uh, of people who have an overdue fine in New Zealand. And they were randomised to receive one of these four letters. So uh, either control, the simplified, the social norm, or the mistake letter. So then we look at the, um, the payment rates after 28 days. Um, and that's asking if they made any payment um, within that time period. And here we can see that the randomization was effective. So this is the, the average amount that was owed uh, before they got the letter by each group. Um, and that's really consistent across groups. So that means we can really rely that um, our randomization was effective. So which do you think was the most effective letter? So we can see the social, the, sorry, the control letter was actually quite effective. 43.8% um, um, would respond to that by paying, which is interesting in itself. And then simplified and the fresh start letters, 45%. That's not a statistically significant increase. Um, but the social norm letter is 3.1 percentage points higher, and that's a 7.2% relative higher increase. And that might not sound like very much, but actually, if we look at it over a year and the financial implications of that, then they can be quite substantial. So if we'd use this social norm letter for an entire year, that would be an additional 200,000 uh, US dollars that we would have collected in full. Um, and if we include the arrangements, so that's the people who um, set up an arrangement to pay in the future, and if all of that was collected in full, then that would be an additional $1.1 million over a year. Um, in reality, the, the, re the realistic number is going to fall between that range because we don't know how many of those arrangements would then go on to be paid in full. But either way, that's a, a really big impact, particularly considering that the cost of our trial was just $3,000. And that's not even including the costs of enforcement fees and court letters and attending court that um, would have happened had they not paid. And we didn't stop there. So since this trial, we've gone on to look at um, other things that affect fines payments. And um, we've done trials with envelopes to see uh, which envelopes are most appealing. And we've also trialed text messages where we've looked at whether um, using social norms in a text message or fairness. So this message says, if you think other people should pay their fines, please call to discuss your fine. Um, so we've been trying out all these different ideas um, in these randomised control trials to see what works best. Sometimes we can't always randomise. Um, so there's often operational constraints that means uh, it's not possible, for example, to send out lots of letters all at one time. Um, but there are things we can do in that situation. So this was a, a letter trial that we did separately to the other one. Um, and in this one, we couldn't randomize, but we could change the letter every three weeks. So that meant that we were able to use um, some statistical methods to identify what the trend would have been in the absence of these letters. So we used two years of historical data, which means we can record the seasonal trends. 
Um, and from this, we can see that uh, we would have expected the, um, the payment rate to have continued along the grey dotted line, and the upper and lower grey lines are our confidence intervals. So the first letter we trialled, the social one, was within that confidence interval, so we don't think it had any impact, whereas the other one was outside the, the visual letter. Um, so that means we can say with confidence that that letter did increase payment rates, even though we couldn't randomise. I'm now going to hand back to Helen to discuss the results. Thanks, Olivia. Um, so when we started on this work, we had one behavioural science expert, and I want to take this opportunity to acknowledge um, B. Schneiders, um, who, who started us on this path. Um, as a result of the positive results that we've had, um, we were able to get funding to set up a team of 10 people um, who we call behavioural science Aotearoa. Um, and that team works right across the justice sector, so we also work with the prison service um, and with police. Um, and we're doing a range of super interesting trials in that space, so ranging from trying to increase attendance at court by defendants um, through to how we communicate within a, a court environment to make sure people can understand what's happening and really participate in that process. Um, we've also been able to use behavioural science theory to support policy. Um, and probably the most interesting example of this is in the COVID-19 space. Um, so New Zealand has used a behaviourally informed response to COVID-19 pandemic um, and the use of the way that we've set up policies and also our communication approach um, to, to um, use these type of principles to encourage compliance with health behaviours, so things like washing your hands um, or social distancing, and also compliance with restrictions that we've had at various points throughout the pandemic. Um, and as many of you will have probably seen in the media, um, we've uh, been very, very fortunate in New Zealand and had a very successful COVID response. Um, we have very high compliance rates among the population and currently we have no cases of COVID within the community, which we're very thankful for. So just to sum up some learnings, um, one of our key learnings is that behavioural insights can be used um, really effectively to increase fine payment. And that randomised control trials really amount, allow measurement of what works for whom. And this is really important because when we're testing different ideas in different cultural contexts, some things will work and some things won't. So what works for us in New Zealand might not work um, in a different country. So it's really important that we test and trial these things. Um, if a randomised control trial isn't possible, we've been able to show that there are different um, analytical techniques that we can use to still um, understand the impact um, of the trials. And so finally, we wanted to just sum up with a call to action. So, um, and that is for you to have a go and to use behavioural science in your work. So behavioural insights have been applied right across the world. Um, there's many, many um, organisations applying this theory. Um, and there's a lot of free resources online. So um, the EAST framework that Olivia referred to, but also a bunch of other things that you can pick up and use and run with. And if you go onto our website, you will see um, some information about the projects that we have been working on. And also there's a, there's a number of free how-to guides that, um, to show you how to apply these techniques yourself. And one I wanted to particularly point you in the direction of is a how to simplify guide. And that talks about um, a very practical step-by-step -step guide of how you can simplify your own communications um, to, to encourage the payments that you're looking for. So um, kia ora koutou, thanks so much for your time today um, and enjoy the rest of the conference.